All right, take a look at this. We're going to start by considering what happens when a simple massive block is resting in an idealized environment. No atmospheric friction, no friction on this horizontal surface. Uh, the weight force is balanced out by the normal force, and the only force acting, the net force, is that of some ideal spring. A string that when you stretch it, it pulls back, and when you compress it, it pushes outward. And then let's look to see what happens to this block. It just oscillates back and forth between the positive extrema and the negative extrema. Uh, so I'm interested in figuring out functions that will describe the position of this object, uh, the velocity of the object, and even, whoa, even the um, acceleration of this object as time progresses. So I'm not exactly sure how to do it, but I think what I'm going to do is start by mapping out the position as a function of time for this object as it oscillates back and forth about this position, the equilibrium position, a word like, you know, its position is zero. So it goes to the negative position, back to equilibrium, goes to the positive position, and it just keeps repeating this phenomenon back and forth, back and forth. And um, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to figure out what's going on with this system in terms of the, of the position, the velocity, and the acceleration. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to sketch in a curve, a continuous curve, that sort of maps out all the positions at all times, not just the times to the extreme positions. That curve, although it's not the traditional way of seeing it, the curve looks like some sort of a sinusoid or even particularly a cosine function. So that's a clue. Uh, let's take a look at this behavior again. Uh, I'm going to define this position to be the equilibrium position. This is where x equals zero, and this is where the spring is not stretched at all. It's unstretched. And then this is the uh, maxima, and the other position is the minima. So uh, what I notice is that the spring force, the amount of force, is directly proportional to the position. And that's when the block's position is zero. There's no spring force at all. And then when the block is to the left of equilibrium and it has a negative position, the spring is pushing to the right. So it's interesting to notate, notice that. Back to equilibrium position again, and then over here, when the block is in a positive position, the spring is pulling in the negative direction, or leftward. Formalizing the mathematics, I'm getting uh, rid of just the scalar quantities of spring force being proportional to the position and looking at the vector quantities, the actual direction of the spring force is opposite to that of the position. And that's why the negative sign shows up there. And here I'm just sort of throwing in that if this spring follows Hooke's law, which describes this ideal relationship for continuous force linearly proportional to the position, uh, then we have a starting point for trying to map out the position, velocity, and acceleration functions for um, this object. Let's take a look. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at the free body diagram for that block with the spring force acting to the left and write out an F equals MA argument for the block. I notice that the only force acting is the spring force, and so substituting for Hooke's law, the spring force being equal to negative kx times the acceleration. The deal here is that I'm looking to represent the acceleration as a function of position. And to do that, I'm going to use my concepts in kinematics to write the acceleration as the second derivative of the position function. I use this nice notation in physics where I use the, the double dot uh, derivative of the position function with respect to time twice uh, is uh, x double dot. And then we'll see what comes out of that. You know, I like this, setting it all equal to zero, and then I'm going to divide by m to get rid of the um, coefficient in front of the squared term. 
as is tradition. Then what I'm looking at here is a second order differential equation based in this crazy position function. I'm looking for a position function uh, that when I take its second derivative and add it to k over m times the function itself, I end up with um, zero. You know, honestly, give me a break. How's that going to work out? Well, it's actually kind of easy. Check this out. The position function I'm going to start with, I don't know what the function is, but I'm going to start with a position function that looks like a cosine function. Well, let me take a step back. So if I assume that the position function looks like this, then what I'm curious about, let me go back a step here, what I'm curious about is, um, well, what you might be curious about is why I chose that particular function. I chose a cosine function because it's periodic. I chose cosine function because I'm modeling the problem starting at an extreme position. Um, x naught is going to be the extreme position, positive or negative. I'm choosing the positive uh, uh, position. So it's the initial extrema. And then um, inside the argument for the cosine function, inside of here, inside of here, what I'm trying to do is um, come up with an argument that allows the cosine function to start over again after every two pi radians, so that when the time at which I'm considering the function is equal to the time period of oscillation, then those two times will be somehow combining to be an integer. And so I'll get um, you know, one time period, one time period, I'll end up with a cosine of 2 pi. And at two time periods, I'll end up with a cosine of 4 pi. And three time periods, cosine of 6 pi. And every, every integer multiple of 2 pi radians, the cosine function starts over again. So that's why I set it up like that. And then um, the capital T is the time period of oscillation, whatever that is. And then, of course, as a result, let me go through and take derivatives of that function I've created to see if that function is indeed the one that models the position of this oscillating block. So I've got to take the derivative of that function and I've got to first know that the derivative of the cosine function is a minus sine function and then I have to apply the chain rule uh, because I've got to take the derivative of what's inside the cosine function's argument which is another factor of 2 pi over the time period. And now I'm going to, going to consolidate all that stuff together with the negative the negative sign out in the front and the 2 pi t, 2 pi over t, and x naught, the sign and whatnot, and group that together. And that will become the velocity function, or, or x dot. And then I need to take the derivative of that function to get the second derivative of position. And it's written like that formally. Here it goes. So that's the function I'm taking the derivative of. As a result, the constant things come out in the front. And the derivative of sine is cosine. I get the argument inside times the derivative of the stuff inside the parentheses. Another chain rule application there. And I'm going to clean that up a little bit. And that becomes the second derivative, or x double dot, with respect to t. So, along the way, this is kind of cool because if that initial function I've writ you know, wrote up at the top is the position function, then along the way of working out the solution to that differential equation we came up with, with Newton's second law, we've got a function that describes or predicts the velocity of the block in time, and then this one we just worked on here is the um, acceleration of the block in time. 
So this is this is cool. If if we guess the function correctly for the position, then as a consequence, now we have functions for position, velocity, and acceleration. All right. So what's going to happen next? So let's let's now substitute in and interpret the results. What we've got is the original differential equation we get with f equals ma, and then I'm just going to write in the second derivative plus k over m times the function itself, the position function itself. I recognize that there's common factors there. The thing I've boxed off in the red brackets there, I'm going to pull it out, factor that out, and leave those two terms of the binomial on the inside. And what I've done right there in that last step is uh, I can divide that thing I've highlighted there in red uh, into zero and just get zero. So the binomial in the brackets on the right is essentially equal to zero. So I can set the 4 pi squared over t squared equal to k over m and I'm, I'm going to solve for t, the time period of oscillation. good part about this is if the spring force follows Hooke's law, then the block's oscillation period is indeed predictable. So our objective in the lab is going to be to set up an oscillating system with a, a linear spring and test to see if craziness, 2 pi times the square root of the mass of the block divided by k, the spring constant, is indeed equal to the time period. Uh, we'll see what happens. All right.